Well, hey guys. So um, you can see I got a different background again even today, which is my office, which gives a nice sense of bookshelves over here and all that. So makes it a little more aesthetic for what we're doing here. Okay, so the final trope of comparative tropes that I want to look at um, in this lecture series is irony. And uh, we covered irony certainly in Barbie doll, um, which I'll talk about and go over a bit. But of all the uses of figurative language, ir irony might be the most difficult to define. Irony is something we just sort of intuitively get a lot of the time. Something feels or sounds ironic. However, perhaps the most identifiable attribute of irony is unexpectedness. So what does it work with irony that it produces the unexpected? The basic definition of irony is when that which is explicitly stated is in contradiction to what that statement implies. In other words, what is meant by the language contradicts what is actually stated. The most basic form of irony is sarcasm. Sarcasm always states something that contradicts what it implies. For example, if you're having one of the worst days of your life and a friend asks you, hey, how you doing? You might respond, boy, I'm just doing great. Or, wow, what a wonderful day I'm having. Obviously, when what you mean is at odds with what you're saying. We use irony in our sarcasm all the time, and sometimes it's emphasized by a tone of voice. Irony, however, is a lot more deep and complex than sarcasm. For one, it is often not as simple and evident as a single statement, such as is used by sarcasm. In many ways, what is implied in contradiction to what is stated can often undermine basic understandings of certain things to allow us to see things in a different way, or even contradicts common sense. Well, this is what makes irony so important to human experience. Even when irony creates a seemingly impossible contradiction or completely undermines common sense, it always feels like the truth. In fact, it might even state a truth of sorts. We see this happen all the time with the many various forms of irony in literature, like paradox, oxymorons, puns. So, an example of irony, and I know we looked at it, for those of you who are in class, a Barbie doll, which might have the most sustained caustic irony that we've seen so far. The very last line of the poem, to every woman a happy ending. Now, completely isolated from the poem, there is nothing ironic about this statement. It actually sounds positive, like a toast or a proclamation, like raising one's glass and saying, may all women have wonderful lives. However, look at what precedes the toast in the context of the poem. The girl child is killed by the stress of trying to fit in. All of her life, she just wanted to look pretty and to be accepted. But it is only when she is dead that everyone calls her pretty. She sought the Barbie doll ideal, but it is only when she's a corpse that she becomes like Barbie. So in the context of the poem, it shifts the whole tone of that line. And it sounds really sarcastic now, right? It uses irony as a way to convey then the poet's rage, their desire to wake you up as a reader. So even though the final line is a simple statement of sarcasm, it points to the deep irony running through the whole poem. For instance, as I had pointed out, the poem is titled Barbie Doll. But the title's ironic at first because there's no Barbie doll in the poem. When you read the poem, it seems to talk about anything but a Barbie doll. And yet the Barbie doll is there, right? In the last stanza, the girl in the casket you know, laying in satin, dressed in a pink and white nightie with nice makeup and a nose job and all of that. She's become like a doll in the box, Barbie doll. And then the irony becomes Barbie doll, you know, is essentially, at least for Marge Piercy, equates to, to poison, to death. Okay, another example. 
the poem that I asked you guys to read, Dolce et Decorum Est by Wilfred Owen, and it presents war through a very deep irony to convey the poet's antipathy towards this war, World War I. Right off the bat, the title of this poem is also ironic. Dulce, et de, Dulce decorum est is Latin for how sweet life is, or in our common phrasing, life is beautiful, or isn't life wonderful? But from the first line of the poem to the end, Owen depicts life in World War I as anything but sweet or beautiful or wonderful. In fact, it's the most ugly and horrific depiction of war ever in literature in many ways. This, the final stanza of Owen's poem, the irony is trenchant. Owen takes a very famous and patriotic motto that becomes an extension of Dolce et Decorum Est but he takes a very patriotic motto for a nation under war and turns it against the war itself. Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori is the Roman creed. It is good and sweet to die for your country. Everything in the poem, particularly the horrifying tortured death of the soldier from the mustard gas, contradicts that patriotic statement. Further, Owen makes it clear that all of the efforts to instill in the young boys at home the glories of war is leading to nothing but massive deaths of youth. Keep in mind that in World War I, the average age of the infantry soldier was like 19, 20 years old. If you go deeper into the poem, you discover the deep irony everywhere. Look at the depiction of the worn down soldiers in the very first stanza. In the similes by which they're described, they're compared to old beggars in alleys under trash bags. And they are also compared to, decre to decrepit and horribly old women coughing up their lungs. How old were most of the soldiers again in World War I? About 19, 20 years old. Hence, the irony is they're being depicted as aged old people, you know, which is completely contradictory. They're 19, 20 years old, but it implies in the poem that this war is so horrible and dragging on so long, it's kind of prematurely aged to them. So the youth of soldiers, healthy and gallantly marching into war that was promoted back at home, is contradicted by the actual condition of these boys after several months in the trenches. So the poem, you know, even though a way you could think of the irony too in the poem is since war is sort of explicitly stated, at least during World War I, as being this, as being this horrific and gallant and ideal thing, this poem implies and undercuts that by saying it's anything but. Okay. We'll see irony definitely and all these other tropes too, but definitely irony in uh, fiction when we get to that. All right, that'll be the final uh, video, guys, uh, for this week. Um, next week, we'll be moving into, we'll continue with tropes, certainly, but we're also going to move into the issue of sound and rhyme and poetry, but particularly sound, how poems sound. All right, we'll see ya.